I believe. Uh, there we go. We're live on YouTube, so we're going to get this party started. No need started to in count down because the three, song already does it. Two. It does in the intro music. What is up, everybody? Welcome to Comic Book Club. I'm Alex. Ooh, I am Pete. And we are coming to you live from a couple of places on the internet. We're live over on YouTube, live on Crowdcast.io, I believe, is the web address. Just wanted to mention that. We wow. also are rolling this out later as a audio podcast. So maybe you're listening to us on Spotify, Stitcher, uh, wherever you get podcasts. Really doesn't matter. It's all good. Thank you for listening. Thank you for yeah, watching. Thank we appreciate you for it. And we should probably mention right off that our third host, Justin, right. is our, off this week. Our right arm. Old Ooh, Justy. Really? Yeah. <laughs> is he our right arm? Well, Which, sure, why are not? you the left arm? Am yeah, I the torso? I What's going on here? Yeah, Which I, pieces of the body are we, Pete? I don't know. I assumed you were the, the head, evil head, and we were the arms. But uh, yeah, JT Sizzle, exciting news. He's going to have a new show. He's going to be traveling the country, drinking and telling magical tales. It's going to be exciting. I can't yeah, wait. It's not even so much a show as he has a cart and he's been going from town to town, spreading right. his magic and wonder wherever he goes. But no, That's he is. Right. We I don't know how much we can talk about it. Let's not blow up his spot or anything. Oh, but I Justin think we is. No, we should not blow up his spot. He is working on a new show, so he's probably he's gonna definitely gonna be gone this week, maybe gone next week as well. We'll have to see. It's it's hard being Justin, you know, the life mm -hmm. of travel and, and luxury. <laughs> you know, being a line producer is a hell of a gig. Exactly. That's definitely what his job is, and that's definitely what's going on. Now, yeah. moving to another job, we should talk about our official chef. Brett Macris, oh, yeah, aka Stray, Stray Bullet. There you go. Uh, as usual, he has curated a drink for the show on this week's show. Uh, if I do say so myself, this was a suggestion from me. Oh boy, of course it was. Uh, That's why you like this. It's a Mancho Rays daiquiri. It's pretty. I'm simple. sorry. What'd it's... you say? A, a Mancho Rays? Uh, Ancho. I'm probably pronouncing this wrong. Okay. Ancho Rays daiquiri. So it's this chili liqueur. It's lime juice. It's a little simple syrup, and that's it. That's the whole and, thing. It wait, is... no, that's not it, because I saw a slice of something on your glass. Sure, yeah, it's a slice of lime. Just as Okay, well, then it's... there's lime. <laughs> You're leaving half the shit out. You're right, absolutely. There's also, did I mention it's in a glass? Like, I didn't just Thank have you. it loose there as a yeah, puddle that I was just Don't have out. loose... Uh, liqueur in your hand. You know there's I mean? a there's. I mean, not that we're not going to a lot of bars because a lot of things are closed down. But as you know, there was this whole trend in fancy bars uh, called slurping on a puddle, where they just pour you a puddle of something. You have to lick it off of the bar. Well, they give you a straw. The classy places would give you a straw, and you could use. Yeah, but not the places in Brooklyn because you can't use straws anymore. You oh, got to bring right. your own straw. <laughs> that's right. You got to bring your own metal straw. I miss those times post COVID, man. We're gonna go to a bar together and we're gonna lick that bar clean. Woo! <laughs> can't wait. I can't wait either. Uh, there you go. Now, one other thing that I'll mention here at the top, since we've been asking folks over the past couple of weeks to do this, if you would like to request a book for us to review in our Stack podcast, you can do that in the iTunes comments. We've been getting some great suggestions. Last week, we got a suggestion for the Empowered Omnibus, which I bring this up here because we promised that we were going to review it in this week's Stack podcast. That's right. We did promise since that. Justin is off. We're going to hold off on that because we want all three of us. Probably, yeah. He might have something uh, good to say about it. Controversial. Oh, yes. Oh, good. Oh, right. yeah. yeah so we go. don't want to, you know, it's... Uh, no, I mean, that's one of my favorite everybody. books. So I'm excited to talk about it, but we're going to hold off on that. That said, if you want to make a request, iTunes comments is the place to go. Drop us an old OGN, a trade, something that we haven't read in a while, or maybe it's something new that we missed. We talked about uh, Mighty Morphin Power Rangers Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles from Boom Studios. Blown away by it. Super fun. Yeah. I'm not even a huge fan of either of those things, and I loved it. I had a blast. So there you well, go. I'm a huge fan of, of both more TMNT, but still, uh, it was very exciting for me. Yeah, there we go. Uh, so there we go. Business out of the way. Let's get to pleasure and bring in our guest tonight. She is the creator of one of our favorite books that has come out recently from Boom Studios called Dark Blood. Uh, she is Latoya Morgan. Hello, Latoya. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Well, All right. I love not to not to get into something that doesn't work for the audio podcast, but I love your background behind you. Is that a <laughs> French... E.T. mural or poster? Or what's oh, yeah. going on? It's, it's a vintage E.T. poster. Um, nice. It was in the theaters when the movie came out. So 
I'm a fan, so I had to get it. Uh, that is I, awesome. I, too, love Reese's Pieces. <laughs> <laughs> Who doesn't? I mean, come on. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's one of the greatest candies of all time. Agreed, yeah. agreed. Well, let's, before we get too deep into candy, let's talk about the book, (laughs) which, as I mentioned, we reviewed, I think, every issue of it on our Stack podcast. We love the book. It's blew us away from the first issue. Now, I'm going to definitely miss a couple of things here, but for anybody who hasn't read it, it's basically, it starts off as this guy who comes home from war, is trying to reconnect with his family, but clearly there's something weird, potentially supernatural going on in the background with powers and other things, it builds to this crescendo that I thought was awesome and so surprising in the last issue. But the big thing that really blew me away about it is how well you managed these multiple timelines across the book. So where did it start? Did it start like with this germ of, okay, this guy from comes home from war, he has powers, what's going on there. And then it split up into the timelines. Do, were you thinking I want to play around with the comic book form? Which direction did it go in? That was a good summary, first of all. Oh. Um, <laughs> yes, um, but I, I, I really started with the idea that I wanted to tell a story about an ordinary hero. So someone who's a veteran, who comes home, very difficult war, behind enemy lines. Um, and, you know, I've always wanted to see both of those timelines. Mm-hmm. And so I, it's so important what happens to him in the past that you can't really tell the story with, in the future, in the present, um, without doing a nod to that. So comic books, I'm a big fan of comic books. I've always loved them. Uh, I think it's such a great, <laughs> it's a great medium to do that. You're able to go back and forth and really um, live in those different timelines and really tell, a, for me, a refreshing story. Uh, I agree. It's definitely a refreshing story. We read a ton of comics, so it really uh, jumped off the page and uh, made quite a difference in our poll list. It was it's it's so different. I want to take a minute and talk a little bit about the art. There's amazing imagery, very powerful. Love how things move, all the action. Uh, can you talk a little bit of like what you wanted to make sure you jumped off the page because the artist absolutely killed it. Absolutely. The the artist for the first couple of issues is a wonderful, wonderful artist named uh, Walt Barna. And he really uh, captured, first of all, just the presence of Avery, even in the way yeah. that he looks. You can just, he just feels like a real person. You feel the, his presence on the page, um, him walking down that alley. That was absolutely the first image that came into my mind. It's something that we all know in the present times, um, and that I wanted to turn on its head. And so when that sequence was really important to the story, um, and he did such a great job capturing that. But my favorite, favorite thing that he did in the, is throughout the books, but especially in the first one, is the war sequences. I mean, he made those dogfights look yeah. incredible. Um, you just felt like you went back in time to that place. Uh, he did such a good job drawing. I love there's a, a page where... Uh, you know, Avery's parachute, you know, is on fire and he's about to, you know, fall, you know, thousands of feet. And you just see the way that Walt drew it down the page of just his panic and his terror and then him falling. It just looks so beautiful. You could feel the movement, even though, you know, it's a still image. Given that you are working in these different time periods throughout here, how much research was involved? What did you look into to make sure that you're capturing it? It was as close to possible in terms of right. Research is really important. I'm a big uh, research person. Um, I worked on a historical show uh, called Turn Washington Spies, you know, for four years. So I was, you know, no stranger to digging through dusty old books and, and reading <laughs> stuff. Um, but I really became fascinated uh, by this story that I'd never heard. Um, And it's only loosely inspired by this, but uh, there was an article that I came across when I was doing my research on the Tuskegee Airmen. And it was, there was an article about this man named Walter Manning, who was a soldier who had gone uh, behind enemy lines and his plane had gone down. Um, And you can Google that story and and see the real thing that happened with him. But it, it was really like, oh my God, I did not know about uh, this to see Airman who had been attacked by soldiers behind enemy lines. Um, and I really felt the need, actually the compulsion to tell a story like that where 
it was just a piece of history that we don't know about and to really shine a light on that but tell it in a really um you know propulsive and exciting way yeah uh, let's talk I about the powers so. a little yeah i'd say so too <laughs> uh, let's talk about the powers a little bit because not only are the powers executed in an interesting way but i also think uh one of the things that i was kind of blown away with with the book is it's not it's not a typical superhero origin story in that it's almost all refusal, no call. The, like he keeps getting <laughs> called and the entire time. He's like, no, leave me out of this. I don't want to do this right up until the very end. But I think often with these sort of books, we see the temptation is end of the first issue is like, and now I'm a hero. What's my name going to be? Let's go forward mm-hmm. from there. So uh, what was important in terms of what his powers were, how you structured them and how you slowly eked out that information over the course of the six issues? I love this question. Uh, I think the most important thing for me, especially in the early uh, books, was to not get ahead of myself. And I know a a lot of, you know, some of the feedback that I've gotten from the audiences, they were like, we want the action right here. We want it right now. But it just did not seem realistic to me that a man in these circumstances would just be like, hey, I'm a superhero now. So I wanted to really make it feel realistic in some way and then also for you to really invest in Avery's character from the beginning so the first couple of books you get to see that he has you know these powers but especially in the second book I really wanted people to be grounded and invested in him and his family and what was at stake for him and what he was trying to do so that when he does you know really lean into those powers and they start to awaken that you're like, hell yeah, I want him to like wreck shop, right? <laughs> and so um, he's dealing with, you know, obviously the craziness of the, you know, the people in this, you know, small towns, very segregated, racist, yeah. small town, and him trying to you know, carve out his corner of life for his family, um, and then constantly being pushed and pushed until he has to let those powers fly. And so that was really the inspiration for that first image, just to take something that we all know, something that we're terrified of, at least, you know, I am for sure, and to go down that dark alley and have something really unexpected and surprising happen and for us to be invested in, and really love him uh, for, you know, displaying those powers. Yeah, I I was really uh, very moved by that moment. I mean, there's definitely, uh, in the last issue, you have this, like, oh, shit, it's the cops, like, just kind yeah. of moment, and it was just, like, so amazing to not ha- you know have it go the normal way to really be able to have him stick up for himself and fight it was just uh it's really fantastic it, it really it, it, it was it really came across uh, uh the comic uh it's it's so great it's one of the things that i love about comics is you know there's real life and there's what we want to happen and yeah. how like, people <laughs> can be this voice you know um uh, I, I was just very moved by it. Is, is there things that uh, you were kind of inspired by or things that you uh, love about comics that kind of had this kind of a, a passion for you? Yeah, absolutely. I love stories that are, are include historical fiction. So, you know, even working on, you know, turn, uh, we knew what the actual history was, but there were times when you got to kind of like bend the rules. You got to kind of like there was we were never going to like kill George Washington because obviously that didn't happen. But, you know, we, this is a spy show. Right. So we got to lean into the spy stuff. So this is, you know, a sci fi for me thriller, um, something that I wanted people to really be along the ride on the ride with Avery for. Um, and so I tried to do that in both timelines. So you have that in the present where he's on the run from the accident that happens in the first issue. And then you see him also on the run in the past and what happens to him um, there and how that influences, you know, what happens in the present. Um, So what I really wanted, and I'm so happy that you said you were moved at the end, because that's really what I wanted. I wanted people to go on this journey and not just you know, eat the popcorn and, you know, have fun, <laughs> yeah, yeah. but to also have some feeling at the end where you're mm-hmm. like, wow, I really am invested in this guy and I hope he's okay. I hope his family is okay. Um, yeah. And to also not go the typical route of, yes, this is taking some challenging, you know, material uh, about you know our real lives in America and to not have it be like this complete and utter downer, right? <laughs> you know, you want to yeah. feel like, 
okay, he had some challenges, he went through some stuff, but God damn it, he came out on top, right? So yeah, that was really what I was going for and what I wanted audience to take away from it. I mean, on the flip side, with uh, villains is probably the wrong word in the piece, but certainly, like you've been talking about, a lot of this has to do with race. It has to do with racism. And one of the things that I also really appreciated it, it wasn't necessarily these cackling evil, like, I'm Captain Nazi villain, you just brought things. (laughs) You have these different gradations of racism that are present throughout the book and that he has to interact with, and it makes the whole thing feel more visible, feel more real, and it it makes it feel more insidious at the same time. I mean, what was it like trying to write some of these scenes? I imagine hard to dig into those characters in particular. Yeah, I just, you know, I really did go down a rabbit hole of looking into what soldiers went through when they came back, um, especially black soldiers. And when they were coming back, they had done these amazing things. Um, The the Tuskegee Airmen are incredible. um, And what they did for, you know, our, our army and what they did for the country, we can never fully repay. And so to to have gone through what he has gone through and then to come back and just to be treated the way that he's treated, it would have been a disservice um, in a book like this to not really kind of lean into what really happened to a lot of them. So there's one, that was one piece of it, which was doing the research, learning. Um, learning about what people had gone through and then putting that on the page. But then at the same time, what I really wanted people to be invested in was this love story. This love story between him and his wife, love story mm-hmm. with you know their family and, and what they were trying to build um, because it's universal. It's something that everyone can relate to. Um, and so the combination of those two things, of the real and the universal, was really the cornerstone for me for this book. Yeah. Now you definitely like, came across... Yeah, like like you mentioned before, you have a history with TV. You said mentioned <laughs> Turn Washington Spies. Um, you wrote and produced for Walking Dead. You worked on Into mm-hmm. the Badlands, Parenthood, one of my absolute favorite shows. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. Shameless, bunch of other things. Did this did this start at all as a TV pitch and morph into comics? Was it always comics? Is it going to go back to TV at some point? <laughs> Where is it in that journey? Listen, I'm going to cross my fingers and go. Maybe, maybe it'll go back to TV. But um, when I initially thought of it, I honestly thought of it as a movie. Oh, wow. I honestly thought about, um, uh, I love the movie Chronicle. Mm -hmm. And I thought like, well, what if there's a, is there a way to do a Chronicle sort of film set in the 1950s or the 1940s? And that's really where the germ of the idea started. And I always had that image of, a man being confronted, a black man being confronted by a white man and unleashing powers that that killed him or that led to his death. And so that was always the, the kernel that was in my mind. And so I just kind of built around that. And I knew as soon as I was gonna make him, I was like, who is this guy? You know, I knew I was gonna make him a soldier. Like what war would that be? Like, how do you, I mean, I just built from there. And so when I started to build out the character, I realized that there were going to be two timelines. And we see that that works on television, too. I don't know. If oh, yeah. Watching, oh. Um, there's tons <laughs> of shows that are doing it. But the, the show that I feel is doing it really well right now is um, Yellow Jackets. Yeah. Oh. And, uh, you know, that is incredible where you get to see like what happened on that island or wherever they are. They're not on the island. That's lost. <laughs> Can- <laughs> Canadian wilderness. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> the same thing. Whatever's <laughs> happening in this horrible forest. <laughs> and then, you know, them in the present, like, grappling with all that shit. And so um, that, this was, I mean, I had this idea, you know, years before that, that show came out. But um, it was really about, you know, building out the character from there. And kind of, I, I always tell writers, really lean into the images and the, the, the snippets that come to you in the most you're taking a shower, you're washing dishes, you're like, hey, get out of my head. Those are the ideas that I just always use my gut to follow. And when they come into my head, I try to latch on to them and get them down and build off of them. Well, I love hearing that too, because we, like Pete mentioned, read a lot of comic books. And I think there's times when you can read something and be like, 
This was a movie pitch. This is they just trying to they're just doing this so that they can pass the story bars by the studio. And that's not what this feels like at all. It really does feel structured for the issue. It's paced for the comic. Um so it's wonderful to hear that it started as this one idea, but you really made it work in this form so beautifully. Thank you. Yeah. And I, you know what? As I speaking of television, since that is where most of my work has been, as I started to dig into the idea and really get into the characters and even build out the villains like you talked about. Um then I started thinking about TV. <laughs> it was like after the fact, I was like, you know what? This could be a TV show. <laughs> oh, that's my day job. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I know. I know. I always, I'm like very, um, you know, agnostic when it comes to like whatever, like I, whatever the idea is, I'm going to figure out what medium needs to be in. And um, I knew that I wanted to start this out as something to show people. I can hand them the first issue and say, hey, can you see this as a TV show? Hopefully they would say yes. Um, yeah. There's enough there in the nugget of, of the first issue where they could see that it has legs, I think. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, right. uh, now, I did want to oh, ask legs. you just, uh, this is because I'm a fan and because right here, even I have my TWD yeah! glass going on. <laughs> what was it like? You wrote for a couple of episodes on Walking Dead. I believe you were a mm -hmm. producer there too. Uh, what was the experience like working on the show? It was absolutely incredible. Um, I worked on two different seasons. So I did a freelance episode in season nine, um, which was so fun. And then I came back and became a producer and a writer regular, uh, regularly on the show in season 11. So that oh, was awesome. a lot of fun. I cannot say enough great things about Angela Kang, who was our fearless leader, um, who is, I don't even know how she like, <laughs> deals with all the stuff that she has to do as a showrunner for the show. You know, now me being a showrunner, I'm like, oh my God. Like that's <laughs> one of the biggest TV shows <laughs> ever to be on television. Yeah. Like, oh my God. Like, she hats off to her um, and the incredible team of writers that she has there. They are my TWD family still. Um, I love working with them. I couldn't, cannot say, um, you know, more complimentary things about my time there. Oh, that's awesome. That's all I hear from anybody I ever talk to on Walking Dead is just like, I feel like there's this outside view from people who don't watch the show, like, oh, it's a grim slog. And then everybody who <laughs> loves the show and everybody who works on the show is like, it's this wonderful family. I'm having such a nice it time. It was. It truly yeah. was. It's so weird. Like, we had so much fun every day. We would get in these big debates. Um, it is no secret if you follow my social media. I'm a big Carol fan. So yeah. like All right. Carol, but like Carol, like in Daryl. And so I would like oh, fight nice. in a writer's room and be like, no, blah, blah, blah. And it was like, <laughs> I was like fighting, being like, no, it's Donnie and blah, blah, blah. And we were just like, oh. we are all such fans of the show. Um, I love we, to hear that. Like, we love it so much that those are the types of conversations we would have every day. And it was an absolute blast. So wait, are you gunning to work on the Daryl and Carol spinoff then? Is Listen, that like... <laughs> if they would have me, I would. <laughs> Warner Brothers might have something to say about that since, since I'm oh, that's right. yeah. now, but um, please, I, I would, I would, there's nothing in the world I would want more than to work again with that group of people. They were incredible. Oh, that's awesome. That's um, so before we let you go though, what are you working on now? What else do you want to plug other than Dark Blood? Yeah, I'm working on a, a, a show called Duster that I created with J.J. Abrams that we're doing oh, wow. for HBO Max, wow. which is hopefully, right. I'm crossing fingers, that'll be you know coming out soon. So that is the, the biggest thing that I'm working on. I'm the showrunner for that. Um, we had a wonderful writer's room last year. We got to shoot the pilot. Um, so that's been going really well. Um, Can't wait to check that out. Yes, yes, that's great. I can't please you know working with jj has been like he's like on my mount rushmore of <laughs> nice. incredible filmmakers so this has been fantastic working with him um and then of course you know dark blood the trade you know comes out you can obviously right now go on comiXology and all those places and mm -hmm. find the the issues there and grab them or you can buy the trade um which comes out in a couple months june 14th is mm -hmm. i think when it's available in stores everywhere Nice. definitely worth picking and up definitely worth yeah. picking up and do you think i mean i know this thing is never definite but do you think if sales are good enough without getting into spoilers it certainly leaves like a germ of opening there at the end would we see a dark blood too potentially i hope 
listen, that's why everyone, if you love the comic, please reach out to Boom and tell them how much you loved it. Um, the comic book, thank goodness, knock on wood, did really well. You know, like first few issues kept selling out. Yes. Um, so it, the numbers were incredible. And I think if there is, you know, a groundswell of people saying, hey, we want more that, come on, they, they, you got to give more. people what they want. <laughs> That's <laughs> right. Well, make them listen to this podcast. That's all we got to do. <laughs> exactly. Uh, Latoya, thank you so much for coming on. It's a pleasure. Congratulations on the book again. Yeah, keep up the great work. So thank you so much. And you can't wait to check awesome. out Duster. Yes, please. Uh, thank you. Yeah, and yeah, we will. Twitter, too. Twitter and Instagram. I'm at Morganic Inc. So awesome. find me on there. I'm always in those Twitter streets. All right. All right. Thanks, Latoya. <laughs> Have a good night. Thanks. Bye. Bye. All right. There we go. Once again, oh, the book is called Dark Blood. As she mentioned, it's available on Comixology. The trade is coming out, and you should definitely pick it up because it's such a good story of uh, Latoya it's, Morgan. It's really it's fantastic, and uh, she is right. I mean, a lot of times when you read stuff in this different timelines, it can get confusing. Uh, she does it so well. Also, that's my dream. That's why I want a writer's room to be a bunch of people arguing about relationships, <laughs> being like, no, they would never do that. Like, that makes me so happy to know that, like, all uh, you, I, let's be honest, all you want to do is go into the Riverdale writer's room and yell at them until they make <laughs> Bughead happen again. It well, isn't every should. writer's room, but it's not they, every relationship. They raised us on that idea. Raised us. Then, what are you talking like, about? You keep saying this like you were born five years ago, which well, that, maybe. The, the season. Uh, you know the the underlying thing of when it starts is this i bughead idea and it won us over and and it was so warm and magical and now they're just playing with our emotions i don't know you're you're crazy all right we're gonna yeah. move on to our next section which is my favorite section because you all make it up as your audience questions <laughs> And for audience questions, pretty straightforward. You can drop a question and ask a question on Crowdcast or drop a question in uh, the comments on YouTube. That's what I wanted to say. And we'll get to those. Uh, yeah, but before we do, Pete, I didn't actually ask you what you're drinking tonight. I'm still drinking. Haven't made much headway on this uh, delicious ancho rays daiquiri, but yeah. Mm. Oh, it's great. So watch you old man sip so it there. It's great. Uh, I'm drinking. Uh, I'm still trying to put a dent, <laughs> dent in my vodka. Oh, yeah. And, you got to uh, do that. It's like a job. Yeah, yeah. And then mix it with a little uh, ginger ale. Oh, nice. What kind of ginger ale? Seagram's? Kind of dry? What's kind of dry. You know what I mean? Nice. Feeling the old, uh, the mm. roots. <laughs> oh, great. Close to Canada. That's all you got up there to drink. That's right. <laughs> Came out of the taps like water. Excellent. Uh, well, why don't we go to some questions? This is from Charlie Bill, Charles Billings, excuse me, over on YouTube. Uh, I'm just doing a quick sound. I think, I think this is all one question. I don't know if this will make any sense, but do you feel that adapting comics into movies or TV shows overshadows the original source material in any way? And do you believe that there are some comics that should be left alone in the perspective mediums, i.e., saga? If so, what comics shouldn't be touched in respect to adaptation? Well, here's the thing. Like, yeah, I mean, I we've seen some things that didn't work. Uh, some, I, I think the, the important thing is if you have this idea, this thing that you love, and regardless of it come it comes on comic or movie or TV that the the I the original kind of like what it was gets to shine through okay now we have things that we can fall in love with whether it's a TV show or a comic book or movie um that then you know Hollywood likes to fucking give us a sequel or fucking adapted to something else or whatever they want to do to make money sometimes you get a watered down version of the thing you love. Sometimes you get something that you don't recognize as the thing you love, but sometimes it can take an idea that's interesting enough and put it in a and show it in a different light and kind of let it grow on its own. And that is fun. That is great. You're kind of expanding on something in a, in a unique way. And I think that it can be achieved, but it's, it's also tricky. Yeah, I think that's very well said, Pete, and I agree. I think to get 
specific. Um, yeah, I mean, there's been movies or TV shows that overshadow the original source material. I think this is a very specific way of looking at it, but particularly when it comes to comics, sometimes casting changes it. We've talked about this a lot, yeah, but like, sure. it's weird to think about how Robert Downey Jr., when he was on screen as Tony Stark, you're like, oh my God, that's like the comic book Tony Stark come to life. Mm -hmm. But now Tony Stark in comics is Robert Downey Jr. Like I think his performance has changed comics enough that they sort of bent slightly to his way of hitting it and his way of doing it. Um, so that's changed it significantly. And I think a lot of the comic materials like that, uh, particularly when it comes to the Marvel end, they felt a more malleable for that sort of thing versus... In the DC comics, it feels like they've mostly just sort of trucked along and been like, yep, this is who Batman is. This is who Superman is. Like, you're not going to see Batman suddenly kind of looking like Robert Pattinson in the books. It's just not going to happen. So I think they do look at that stuff as different things. You think so? You think? We're well, see I don't know. I mean, I think if it the movie does well enough, they'll want to maybe be like someone write a, a Batman that looks like Robert Pattinson. You know what I mean? Like, maybe. Yeah. Sure. Sure. If, Great. If they think they can make money off it, they'll try. Well, you run that Twilight blog on Tumblr for a couple of years, right? Yeah, that's me. I'm tumbling <laughs> it up. <laughs> I know what all of those words mean. I'm yep. the page. Uh, and then on the flip side, when we're talking about things that shouldn't be adapted, um, I don't think so. I don't think there's anything that should not be adapted. There's just well, things that are not well adapted, you know? Yes. I think that there are things that, you know... Um, yeah, there are some things where you're like, oh, that was such a perfect version. Don't you touch that. You know what I mean? And, uh, you know, you're worried about what would, what it would be. But I mean, Watchmen is this example of here's amazing, uh, piece of writing that had its flaws for its times or whatever, but also like had some really powerful ideas that shine through horrible movie i mean i would say there's some parts in the jail that were just so perfect but otherwise pretty bad movie then the tv show brought it to a whole nother level and and took something that was the, the source material and brought it to life in such a different updated more powerful way in some aspects well i think that almost points to not across the board the successful way of doing it but the at least in a couple of examples, how they've successfully done it, where Zack Snyder's movie was this mostly faithful retelling, almost panel by panel of what happened in Watchmen. And it didn't work because Watchmen is inherently commenting on the comic book form. Then what uh, Damon Lindelof and company tried to do with the Watchmen TV series is do something that commented less on comic books and more on TV and more on media because that's what they were doing it through and came up with this continuation of the story that still riffed on the original Watchmen and jumped off various points there. But like you said, was so smart and so different. Another one that came to mind very similarly, and I know we disagree on this one, but I'll mention it anyway, is Umbrella Academy, which I think tried to be too faithful to a fault in the first season and ended up being very even and I really just like it was just a tv show right there was nothing too lively about it except for certain parts here and there exactly like you're saying with the watchman movie and then in the second season i think what they realized is like we have these actors we kind of got to just do our own thing and there's still things they touched on with the comic book but i think once they got past that first season reportedly gerard way was like do whatever you want and to me it seems like first season they're like well he said do whatever you want but we want to be respectful of this vision. And the second season, they were like, oh, we can actually do whatever we want, and then leads into what was strong and what was fun about each of the characters and the characters. And that's what ultimately made it more successful, while still touching on things here and there from the comic book. So this is a long way of saying, with both of those things, I think are really good examples of like, take what works about it, but realize you're working in a different medium with particularly when you're translating it into TV or movies with live actors. So what is the strength about them? You can't expect them to walk off a comic book page and be exactly the same because that's not how those characters are. And that's not how they act. Well, I mean, you look at Cassie and preacher to me, it looks like he mm -hmm. walked right off the page and uh, it's such a, ma a magical kind of way. 
Yeah, I mean, I think that's an exception to the rule, right? Like, I'm forgetting, a blanking on the name for the actor, but he absolutely is the Cassidy from the comics 100%. But also Tulip and Jesse are a little bit different. And uh, And, there's a discussion going on right now in the the crowd cast here where, you know, Gene Hackman, Lex Luthor. To me, I loved uh, Gene Hackman, loved Gene Hackman very much. His Lex Luthor is a different kind of Lex Luthor to people. You know what I mean? So it's like, uh, you know, that can either make or break you on that. And uh, I mean, to me, if you talk about like definitive depictions of Lex Luthor, I'm going to go with Jesse Eisenberg every time. Like, oh, God, come on, dude. Dude, That's... you're the one who's drinking Granny's peach tea on the podcast. <laughs> Who cares? At least I'm not talking ridiculous blasphemy over there. I mean, come on, man. Come on. That's awful. That's awful. Go, go F yourself with that. That's just ridiculous. That's a great place to end that question. Why don't we move on with one here on Crowdcast. This is from Jolene. Do you have trouble criticizing a story about a character or characters you love, even when it has many issues with it? On the flip side, what about when a story does something cool and fun with a character you hate? This may or may not be mostly for Pete. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's one of those things, though, uh, you know, because different characters mean different things to different people. And what makes the character great to you does not mean anything to anybody else. Like Wolverine's height uh, apparently doesn't matter to a lot of people, but it was super important to me. So like there is all these things about characters that we're drawn to. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's about, I can let go of that. If what I'm seeing in front of me is better or more evolved, or at least maybe if I'm in a better, more evolved place, maybe. Um, I do think from my perspective, when it comes to comics, I do have, there, there are some weak points, I think for myself, like the flash is probably a good example where I have a much lower threshold for like, yeah, I'll read a flash story. I just like the flash. That's fine. And I think we all have characters like that, particularly when it comes to comics. I'm definitely yeah. more critical when it comes to TV shows and movies, probably because that's my day job versus comics at our podcast. And things are technically what I'm doing for fun. Um, and on the flip side, when a story does something cool and fun with a character you hate, I think that's a time when I'm like, cool if it's cool it's cool and it really doesn't matter who the character is ultimately i think particularly with comics that comes down to the art so if the artist has killed it on something i don't care who the character is as long as it looks awesome there you go uh this is from youtube uh from stanley do you have any opinions about the banning of the mouse comic book I assume mostly everybody is familiar with this now, but there was a school district in Tennessee that pulled Mouse from the eighth grade curriculum, uh, saying they didn't feel it was totally appropriate for them, particularly because of nudity, uh, as well as some of the more adult content in the book. Uh, They later went on to clarify, and I'm paraphrasing their statement there, that they weren't saying anything that was objectionable about the message of the book necessarily they are uh anti-holocaust and all of those things uh but they just didn't feel like it was right for eighth graders um luana is saying i'm making them sound sympathetic lol here's the thing uh i don't think they're sympathetic and i do think it's an excuse and i think it's ridiculous because frankly i read mouse in eighth grade and i'm fine I mean, Pete, you might debate the whole fight of it all, but like, <laughs> I think Mouse was one of these books that, for anybody who hasn't read it, first of all, go read it. It's one of yes. if not, one of the best graphic novels, two part graphic novels of all time. There is some adult content in it. Like I think people sometimes forget that a lot of it is about Art Spiegelman finding out that his father had an affair, among other things. But at the same time, by the point you're in eighth grade you know about a lot of this stuff. Like, I think we can, don't have to be precious, that precious about eighth graders and what they know or do not know. And particularly something like Mouse, where the whole point is to abstract the idea of the Holocaust through mice and cats and other animals so that we're more easily able to get into that material and understand it and then deal with the horror of it on a very visceral level. I remember very specifically reading that book And that was a whole entryway to me, just on a very base level of, 
away from superhero comics. Like that was, I don't know that that was necessarily the first non-superhero comic I read, but I read that and I was blown away. And then I tracked down other things that Art Spiegelman had read. And at the time it was very hot and heavy with the comics with an X movement. Uh, And I remember very specifically like going to Forbidden Planet and tracking down some of that stuff and buying those books from dropping the name of a comic book shop. That's not a flex beat. Uh, But picking up like Raw, which was the uh, alt comics collection that Art Spiegelman edited for a couple of years. And then that being an entryway point to a lot of other books that I had no idea about. So even beyond the idea of you should be reading and you should be learning about the Holocaust and you should understand it. And comics and graphic novels are the perfect way of doing it because it does abstract those things and make it an entry point versus going to a Holocaust museum and seeing a pile of teeth, to be frank, which is another thing that I did at a similar age because I went to Hebrew school Throughout my youth, I went to Hebrew high school and they never shied away from teaching about us about the Holocaust from a very young age. So maybe from my Jewish education perspective, that's a specific case where I understood all of this stuff and I understood the importance of talking about all this stuff. But I think particularly for people who don't, it's important to be able to read that. So you go, okay, I get this what this is about. And there's a level of removal there when you're reading Mouse before ultimately it does suck you in and wear down those levels of removal. That's the beauty of the graphic novel. So this is all an incredibly long way of like saying my opinion is no, don't ban mouse. They should teach it in more schools. They should hand it out in schools. And I think uh, I know this from firsthand experience with my kids is we've been very lucky here in Brooklyn where they look at graphic novels as okay as part of the reading program. Uh, certainly they are past it here in terms of like, those aren't books, but the rest of the country gets got to get to the program here because like, If the kids are old enough to read Diary of Anne Frank, they're definitely old enough to read Mouse. And if you're old enough in eighth grade to do that, which you are, just do it. Just make it happen. Yeah, I mean, any book sucks, man. That's that's dumb. Uh, Plus, you know, how old are you in eighth grade? Eight years old? You're old enough. I mean, what the fuck, man? Yeah, they're like in the bathroom talking about sucking dicks or whatever. Like, get over it with (laughs) naked mouse, you know? I'm wow. serious. I'm serious. Like, by right, the point... Are you, you're in the bathroom a lot where the 8th graders are? You hear this? Not 8 <laughs> years old, Luana, not 8th grade. Jesus Christ. No, I made that joke. I said, well, what are they, 8? I don't know how they are, they are in 8th grade. Yeah, you're the age you are in the grade. Yeah, that's how <laughs> when, I remember it. When you're in 12th grade, you're 12. 12, yeah. Exactly. Absolutely. First grade, 1. Yes. Um, any other graphic novels you think they should teach, Pete? Maybe like Spider-Man One More Day or anything like that? <laughs> no. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'm pro more graphic novels, but uh, yeah, I don't know, man. I don't know either. Uh, here is uh, another one from Charlie Billings over here on Crowncast for your Stack Podcast. How do you guys typically consume your comics? Do you do mostly digital, physical, or a mix of the two? How do you determine whether or not you want a comic in physical form or not? Uh, so just for the stack podcast, we send everything through as PDFs, just because that's how I get them in terms of review copies, or we read stuff online through other platforms. But Pete, you still prefer physical copies at this point? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, I don't have a lot of space for physical copies, but, um, that's one of the things I miss about doing the live show is we would all bring our comics together and kind of like pass them around and be like, I think this is worth talking about and that kind of stuff. So I miss that physical kind of interaction as far as like uh, uh, picking things and holding things. But um, it's nice not to waste, uh, you know, paper, I guess. (laughs) Yeah, that's true. Uh, This is from Pablo D. Martinez. What is the oldest comic still in your collection and why did you like it? Oldest comic in my collection? Probably. uh, Probably, I think Felix the Cat is probably the. Oh, wow. The one that like is mine. I have some like stuff that was hand me down i think from my dad or 
or just like family members that's like old western stuff but uh that's not i like my i remember it was like a 10 cent or 15 cent uh felix the cat um mm. and the reason uh it's my favorite is just the creativity of uh you know it was like felix that cat and hot stuff at the time and just the the creativity of the physical humor was uh, one of the great things I loved about those characters. Um, the oldest ones that I have in my collection that I can't read, uh, which I showed off on the show, I want to say a year ago, were my dad's old comics that included like Fantastic oh, wow. Four annual number two and other things. But they're basically crumbling into dust at this point, so I wow. can't take them out. But the oldest one that's mine... Uh, is a graphic novel called Spider-Man Hookie, which I've mentioned a bunch of times on the show, but I don't know if folks have read. It's about Spider-Man is sick with a cold, and then he meets this kid who takes him to another dimension where they end up fighting this beast that becomes bigger every time they beat them. And this is definitely a nut flex, but I'll throw it out anyway. So my mom is a children's book author. She used to teach at SVA, the School of Visual Arts, and one of her students got a job working at Marvel Comics. She mentioned, oh, my son loves comics when I was super little and re relatively little. I think it was probably like, I don't You're know. Probably 12th or, grade. Yeah, 12th grade, something like that. So 12. Yeah. And uh, he said, oh, does he want to come by the Marvel Comics office. And I was like, uh-huh, <laughs> yes, Alex want to do that. Uh, so I went over, and this was in the days, I could only vaguely picture this, but this was in the days when they still had like a bullpen with people working there. Uh, and I think he worked as an inker or a colorist or something like that. Wow. But I went in, he showed me around the office, and he took me to one of the editor's office. And I'm definitely getting this uh, wrong, but I, I'm sure it was like, uh, Tom DeFalco or something like that, like some very old school editor had a box of graphic novels there. And he's like, Hey, do you want to take some graphic novels? Just take whatever you want. And I was like, oh. Oh. eyes becoming as big as my head. And so I ended up grabbing one of the first digitally created graphic novels that starred Iron Man, which I'm blanking on the name of. There was a Gru graphic novel oh, that I also uh, took because I loved Gru. Uh, and there was this Spider-Man hooky book, which is incredible. And I've read so many times over the years. Um, so that that's the big one for me. That's the one that's like definitely from when I was little, definitely has like this story that I remember every time I pick up the book, but it's also a really good book. I mean, that's a, that was a good mom flex, dude. You know, sometimes I make fun of you for your flexes, but that was a, that was a solid mom flex there. That was a good mom flex there. You yeah. Go. Uh, this is from Kevin. What's a canceled TV show you think would be well suited to a comic book continuation? And what studio do you think would do it justice? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good question. Canceled TV show canceled that would have a good comic book continuation. I mean, the first thing that comes to mind is A-Team. Um, Was yeah. that canceled? Well, I think so. Well, it's not on air anymore, so I had to Are be... you sure? I feel like it's still going somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Reruns, maybe, but yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, Mr. T just still does it in his basement, that's all. Yeah, nothing wrong with that. Uh, Jason Isson says Studio 60. That would be a great one. Love to see the comic book adventures of that. How do they solve all those problems? <laughs> um, two I'll throw out there. One, I feel like I mention this show all the time, but just it's one of the first things that I think of when cancel shows is Journeyman, which is this time travel show. Um, it was so unique because it had a cumulative effect. Like it was not, he kept going back in time and changing things and he'd like solve a problem back in time. But then when he came back to his time, be something else wrong it, it, something would be horribly wrong and his life just got worse and worse every single episode it was just this grueling awful thing to watch but so smartly done and so intense and that would be i think a very cool comic the other one this is not necessarily like a superhero show but veronica mars might be fun as a comic book just as an ongoing thing nice I don't know yeah. if they have a good one but that would be enjoyable uh here we go uh i think we got one more here <laughs> this is from the one another is your mom jane breskin zalvin yes you figured me out my mother is the person with the same last name as me she's mm -hmm. written 
a lot of children's books and YA novels. Um, here's a little Easter egg for everybody. If you can find it, there is one book that she wrote for fifth and sixth graders uh, that has my picture on the cover. And it was endlessly embarrassing to me. Because what? Every, everybody would ask me. They'd be like, oh, that book's about you, right? And I'd be like, no, it's not about me. Leave me alone. What are you talking about? It's just about a kid who's my age who looks like me and my picture's on the front. <laughs> Your actual like picture's on the front? She or drew me cartoon? on the front. I didn't Where's ask her to. In fact, I asked her not to. Why isn't that your profile pic for, like, everything, man? Oh, God, no. Come on! Your mom drew you? You asshole, that sounds amazing! I'm also, I'm also in some of her books as a bear. (laughs) (laughs) She has a series of books about... like an evil genius who's, like... No, it's nothing like that. Uh, But she also has a series of books about... Uh, this Jewish family, they're Jewish holiday books, and they're all bears in the books, but they're all members of my family. So other people read it, like they sell it at synagogues and stuff. And people are like, we love this book. And so I look at them like, that's Uncle Charles. He, he's a bear. <laughs> it's very weird. Uh, Uncle Charles isn't as entertaining as he is in the book. <laughs> <laughs> Eats a lot less honey, I'll tell you what. <laughs> All right, I think that is it for this week's questions, and we are going to move on to our next section, which is trivia. <laughs> and for that, we're going to turn it over to Pete the Page. All right, this is the part where we give back to you, the lovely audience. It's an opportunity to win twenty-five free dollars to Midtown Comics Online. Selves, do we have someone picked, or are we pick? Uh, we don't for this week. So, if anybody Ooh. would like to do trivia, either say hand up or me First or something like that, guy. either here in Crowncast or over in I YouTube. Say that in a general, a non-specific gender mm-hmm. or binary way, uh, and over on YouTube in particular, if you say it, just so you know, there's going to be a delay. But who would like to do trivia? If not, I'll do trivia, Pete. What? No, we got to give. No, I'll do it. I'll like down. donate the money to. Oh, okay. All right. Well, that's what's weird. a worthy cause? I don't know. I'll uh, I'll buy a copy of Mouse for somebody who hasn't read it. How about that? Oh, there you go. Nice. Yeah. I'll tell that's you what, we're not getting any volunteers here. So, oh, we got oh, a hand up. There hey, we go. there we go. Let's bring in Jay Citizen. Whew! Right. Just in time, almost Saved bought you. a copy of Mouse for somebody. Yeah. That was close. <laughs> uh, Pete, I'm excited to find out which dead celebrity you're paying tribute to this week. That's going to be a lot of, a lot of fun. A lot of fun. A lot of fun. Yes, good times. Let's, uh, let's, uh, a lot see. of dead celebrities. Hey, hey hello. Hey, hey. Welcome to the show. Great to have you. Thanks for raising your hand. Appreciate it. Uh, so today's trivia is on topical comic news and a small nod to the legend Louis Anderson, R.I.P. Uh, we're finally I saw up him to live. He was the first comedian my dad took me to. Oh, oh that's man. amazing. We tell oh. people he's the first. The first was actually Cosby. So but we decided he's the first. Yeah, don't mention you that. You got to adjust for the times. All right, so uh, please listen to all three options before making your selection. Here we go. Question number one. Acclaim painter. Alex Franklin is painting what for Black History Month at DC? Is it A, six variant covers, B, five variant covers, or is it C, Larry Flash Jenkins? So it's either six or you could be wrong. Well, let's go Let's go with six. There you go. A is the correct answer. Six variant covers. Beautifully painted. Can't wait to see them on the comics. They look amazing. All right, here we go. Question number two. Marvel in March will celebrate Women's History Month with blank. Is it A, Women of Marvel number one, B, Women of Marvel zero issue, or is it C, Christy Swanson? So it's either A, or you could pick B, which would kind of not be cool to have Women of uh, Marvel zero issue. Let's go with A. A is correct. Wow. Great. Here we go. Last one. In the Substack news, Kelly Thompson's book called Black Cloak is set in a fantasy blank. Is it A, Del Taco, B, Metropolis, or is it C, Del Close? So it's either A, Don't Pick It, or it's B, Metropolis. Uh, B. 
That's right. It's set in a fantasy metropolis. Wow. Seems like a great one. Amazing, amazing. Now, do you have a guess as to the secret Louis Anderson movie that Pete is Louis hinting Anderson at? and Del Close? That's right. Like, like, he was only in, like, one movie, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah. So, what movie was that? Oh, shoot, I know, because I think I just watched... It's a, it's an Elaine May movie, isn't it? Uh, it's Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Kevin is correct. Wow. Don't close this in that movie. That's right. Huh. Oh, cool. All right. Yeah. Well, congratulations. You have won a $25 gift card to Midtown Comics. Just shoot us an email at comicbookclublive at gmail.com, and we will get that to you. And have a great night. Yeah, enjoy. Awesome. Thanks, guys. All right. Great seeing you. And for anybody out there who wants to compete in trivia for a very easy $25, I That's will right. drop the form in the comments here, or you can check it out on our Twitter at Comic Book Live. But Pete, new comic books coming out once again. What are you looking forward to? Oh, my God. Uh, you might be surprised by this. Okay. Okay. Sabretooth number one. Oh, uh, yeah. That is a huge surprise. You, you never liked this character before. I usually don't know, um, but yeah, it was uh, it was a very fun take on it. All right. Well, I'm looking forward to the excellent number one. Just let's continue with the X Men books. Oh, uh, this great. is Peter Milligan and Michael Allred and Laura Allred coming mm-hmm. back to the mm-hmm. world of Ecstatics, which is just the best. So very excited to check that all out. And there's a ton of other books that we're going to be checking out, including those in our Stack Podcast, which drops in the Comic Book Club feed and also its dedicated Stack feed every Wednesday at 9 a.m. And folks, that is it for this week's show. Thank you so much. We want to thank Latoya Morgan for coming on. Please check out Dark Blood for Boob Studios. Yeah, please do. It's awesome. Individual issues are all out now, or you can check out the trade in June, as she mentioned. And next week, we're going to have John Westhoff will be here to talk about Drumsticks of Doom. A couple of other things to plug before we go. Riverdale After Dark. We have a special episode that dropped talking to Nikolai Witchell, Dr. Colonel Jr. Oh, himself. Man. There was so Couldn't much fun. I can't believe how not creepy that guy was. What an actor. Oh, my God. It was great. I had such a great time talking to him, so definitely check that out. Also, yeah. patreon.com slash comic book club to support this show and all the shows we do. iTunes, Android, Spotify, Stitcher, or the app of your choice to subscribe and listen and follow. Don't forget to leave us a comic book review request in the iTunes reviews at Comic Book Live on Twitter, Comic Book Club Live on Instagram, Comic Book Club Live.com for this podcast and many more until next time good night take care of yourself out there daddy's peach tea special